The points I want to address today um, go broadly in the dimensions of the EU politics that we are all involved in, whether we want it or not. The question of political participation. The question of competitiveness and solidarity, whether they can possibly be reconciled. The question of generations. We keep talking you know, about young people. I'm not quite sure whether I'm one of you or whether what kind of generation I am, what kind of generation we all are on the panel, and whether we have a right to talk to you as young people, or whether when we talk about young people, should we be talking about my little daughter who is one and a half years old? You know, what about her future? So a question of generation I think would be good to talk about politically as well. And then I want to finish with a couple of actual proposals or examples pointing to things that can be done rather than just an analysis of what's going wrong. Now, let me start um, with the EU dimension. Um, we've heard about the EU a lot already in the morning session um, before lunch. And there is a sense that there is something new about what the European Union is doing with the austerity politics, with the Troika politics. But I think it's quite important to see that there is also a lot of continuities the kind of neoliberal policies that we have seen roughly from the 1990s onwards, there is a direct line to what is going on now. The idea that every member state in the European Union has to be competitive, if necessary, competitive against the other member states. Um, that's something that we see continued. What is new, however, is the kind of format, the mode of governance. And the mode of governance that we are now witnessing in the European Union is increasingly authoritarian. That is, it used to be that neoliberalism was kind of consensual. Everybody agreed, as long as growth rates are going up, as long as the economic and monetary union is going well, we're kind of okay with it. Because, you know, we have... You know, we have Erasmus exchanges, we have a common currency, um, Europe is doing well. Now that we have experienced the crisis, what we see is that the European Commission and the European Council have to force through their governance, the different sort of, you know, different pacts, different treaties, the whole sort of big whole of economic governance, they have to push that through with discipline. They have to sanction their measures. And that's a qualitatively new thing. Now, what does that mean for citizens? What does it mean that we increasingly see a hardening, sort of tightening of EU governance? It means that the national parliaments, for instance, proportionately lose influence because many of the economic governance measures are discussed at the level of the Council and the European Commission. And the Council and the European Commission are fairly isolated from parliamentary politics from the kind of legislative. If you think about the European Union as a sort of kind of state, but not quite, you have the executive, you have the legislative, and you have the judicial part. And the parliament, even though they want to be stronger, do not have a lot of say in many of these economic governance dimensions. And that's problematic because where do citizens have influence? It's through the parliaments. It's through the national parliaments and the European parliament. So even if you wanted to be involved in EU politics, it cannot be through the Parliament. Now, the European Union has recognized that to some extent, and they have come up with a couple of new initiatives to make sure that citizens feel they are being heard. For instance, the European Citizens Initiative. There's been a couple of attempts to try and get direct democracy into the European Union. The problem is, it simply does not work or it does not work the way it was intended to do. What does that mean then? For someone who is progressive, for someone who is young, from Spain, from Greece, from Portugal, from Cyprus, from Ireland, from Germany, from Denmark, if you wanted to change something in the European Union, should we just throw our hands up and say, okay, we have to leave the European Union, or we cannot engage with EU institutions? I don't think that's the case. I think we should try as much as possible and as far as possible to exercise the little influence we have on the European Union. And that has to be through national elections. 
So saying that the EU is neoliberal and that the Troika is neoliberal and that we don't have any influence, I think is giving up too easily. So we need to think about how to use the existing channels, the existing political channels that we do have, whatever is left, as little as it might be, to at least use that. Now that's my first provocative point, and I would invite you to disagree with me as well. Um, what does that then mean for political participation in general? I already sort of said, you know, voting still is a good idea. Even though it feels like the political system might be the same that it always was and it doesn't hear young people. I think it's a real problem that the participation and the representation of young people in most parliamentary systems is not very expansive. That's a real problem because many of you, most of you, are highly educated and you have all sorts of political education even at school level. So before you are able to vote, you know what you would vote. But there are very few representatives in the established parties that would actually focus on young people. There's a simple reason for that. There's more old people. And old, elderly, older people, whatever generational terms you want to use, they have different interests. So in a way, it's a, it's a problem or collapse of representation, if you want. Uh, but you can overcome that if only you keep engaging with the party political system. So leaving established political channels altogether and not going to vote, unfortunately, is not the solution either. Now, so that's kind of speaking to the idea that there is a, a decrease in young voters. That's actually not the case in Spain. And I find that really interesting. Um, so young people still go and vote in Spain. So that's really good. Um, but what we, sh what we see in particular with, for instance, the, the emergence of new political movements like Podemos is that the established channels and the new forms of political participation, they're becoming more fluid. You see that also in Greece, for instance, with the Syriza. Very, very interesting, fascinating processes where the assumptions we have about what representative democracy looks like are changing. You see that in Iceland, for instance, where they had an online electronic process of setting up their new constitution. This is where new technologies can actually be useful. So rather than sitting on Facebook, you can actually use new media and new technologies to try and change a more sort of into a more fluid democratic system. Now, Coming back to this kind of notion of intergenerational conflict, this is something that's being brought up a lot when we talk about democratic challenges, political challenges. And I think to some extent it's a bit of a smokescreen. It's something that is being used to say, oh, you know, it's this generation against the other generation. It's you against your parents because you have completely different interests. Um, the interesting thing is here that you have very different life experiences than your parents. Most of your parents have grown up from the sound of the kind of baby boom generation onwards um, in a period of relative economic stability. In Spain, obviously, coming out of the Franco regime, joining the European Union, these were big transformations, but still some of relative economic stability. You, on the other hand, and I'm sort of get it, guessing your age here, you have never lived in a situation where there wasn't a crisis in the European Union, at least in your politically conscious life. Who of you can remember a European Union where there wasn't a crisis? Let's say before 2007. Most of you probably started reading newspapers, becoming politically active in the mid to late 2000s. Now I think that's fascinating because that gives you an opportunity of not taking economic stability for granted, not thinking that the post-war period um, was the best thing ever. It gives you a chance to see capitalism with all the crises and all the contradictions and all the instabilities. In a way, it sort of turns the notion of precariat into something positive that can be used. Um, it also means, unfortunately, that insecurities are sort of woven into your everyday life experiences. And psychologically, that's very problematic. So if you look at your generation and you think about, okay, how many of us 
will be comfortable having children? How many of us will be trying to emulate these previous discourses about what life should be? You go to school, you go to university, you get a job, you have a family, you buy a house, you have a, bar, I don't know, a car, a cat, and an apple tree. Um, these are discourses that come from a parent generation which try and push them or try and impose them onto people, onto young people who are living in very different circumstances. So this whole intergenerational conflict, I think, should be seen as a discursive construction and not as something that is actually on the ground a political struggle as such. And you should tell your parents just that. You should tell the older generation in parliament, in the press, in the corporations that you do not actually live in the same circumstances and that they should recognize that, that they should not expect of you to repeat the same life models that they have done. This is important for political dimensions because it means that you will vote differently and that you will participate politically in very different ways. So I would strongly say that you are not the lost generation. This is something that you hear a lot, in particular with regard to the peripheral uh, member states in the European Union, the lost generation of Greece, Italy, you know, the one that have to leave their countries to actually find jobs. That's a discourse that can be potentially toxic because if you start believing in it, um, you will consider yourselves lost. Um, I think, again, for the first time, you guys are actually the ones that can see the European Union for what it is because you have grown up in it. So you have much more right to critique it and to change it, to change the very structures of European Union or go beyond it or try and reclaim Europe so the European Union does not necessarily have to be the same as Europe. There are European structures outside Europe. For instance, there are now many networks that try and work together against austerity at the European level, but not at the EU level. So transnational social movements, many people in this room are actually connected to them in one way or the other, whether they are on a trade union basis, on a social movement basis, on an academic basis. These are forms of social organizing which are not reliant on the European Union. And I think that's quite interesting and that's something that the young generation can do because you have grown up and grown out of Europe, if you want. With regard to the political dimension, that we're trying to sort of address here as well. I think it's quite important to, as Jamie already said, you should not generalize too much. We should be aware of how the crisis affects men and women differently. I was talking to uh, uh, some of the other participants today, um, looking at the health effects of the crisis. The rate of suicides has gone up massively in Greece, but it's male suicides. There's a very distinct gender effect of the crisis on men. The same way, a very distinct effect of the crisis on women, for instance, when public sector cuts um, uh, uh, set in, and mainly female unemployment um, rises. So we need, to be, we need to be aware of these political dimensions for our analysis of the crisis in the first place. But then what is to be done? What can we do? Where, where are cracks in the system, if you want? Um, in particular for young people. Um, and here I would really say that at the end of the day you have to, well you don't have to do anything. You don't have to listen to people who tell you what you have to do or not. Because again, as a young generation, you're the ones who will have to find your own way, rather than listening to you know, the kind of vanguard, professional, um, uh, uh, let's say, organizers. Um, but I think it would make sense to use all the channels that you do have at the local, the regional, the national, and the transnational European level. So only focusing on the local, only focusing on the grassroots, in a context where we have so much political top-down um, governments and measurements and, and, and austerity politics, only focusing on the very local will probably not be enough. Only focusing on the European will also not be enough. You have a lot of interesting experiments in Spain, um, for instance, with the PA, which are local struggles, but are linked. And they're now trying to communicate them also to the European level. 
You have very interesting experiments in Spain with Podemos at the national level. Podemos is now also, as far as I know, trying to reach out to some of the other European movements. So the new forms of participation, I think, have to come in multiple ways. And that is tricky. That is potentially also scary because that's new. That's not something where you can rely on your textbooks. It's not something where Marx can come in and say, oh, you have to do it this way. It's not something that Lenin stands in the background and says, oh, you know, political organization and this is how we do it. These are new forms um, and new conjunctures as well. Um, so in a way, the, the, the main message I think I want to try and, 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 and convey is do not give up on Europe. You don't necessarily have to engage with the European Union as such. There are, again, there are ways around it. There are forms of organizing that bypass the EU. But do not ever give up on the idea of Europe. Because at the essence of, of the end of the day, um, what you are is European citizens. Um, there are many movements that would now say we have to focus back at the national level. We have to defend what we have. And I think that is a short-termist idea. That is an idea that doesn't help anyone. What you should try and do is talk to other young people in Denmark, in Germany, we have a few Germans here, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Finland, and try and, rather than be competitive with each other, try and be solidaristic across Europe, across generations, and keeping in mind that all of these political dimensions need to be attacked through all channels possible. I think I'll stop there.